Minutia's back, and it's some freaking cool-ass Minutia. We've got Jacques from Backstage Auctions, and he's got a brand-new auction with some amazing KISS collectibles that you actually get to see in this show. That he amazing doesn't open. Stuff. stuff he doesn't open, I want to remind you guys, too, because he's cool. Yeah, whatever. This is Three Sides of the Coin. Talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I'm one of your three co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, as always, joined by Tommy Summers and Mark Cicchini. Woo-hoo! Before we go anywhere, i got to share, because I know it's just going to flip and piss off people, but don't you love my new End of the Road Tour t-shirt? <laughs> It's the best thing in the world. I would that. It's that cool. It's, I would it's, almost. It's so bad in so many different ways that I had to buy it. And yes, it it's a bootleg. It is sweet looking, though. It's, it it's is cool. Sweet. I, I just, I love, I love the fact that they put Crazy Nights on the End of the World Tour. Uh, beautiful, whoever did that. Um, real quick, before we get into a couple other things I want to mention... Don't forget our Ace Fraley Spaceman Pitcher Disc Contest. Head over to threesidesofthecoin.com slash contest. You can enter to win the exclusive Record Store Day Pitcher Disc of Spaceman. We've got one we're giving away. Don't forget about Three Sides of the Coin Radio every Sunday night, 8 p.m. Pacific. Uh, We just had a very cool show where we played the entire Lost Alive 2 bootleg. Very cool. And uh, I actually dug up, per Russell's recommendations, the bootleg from 1995 in Tokyo as well. That's a long-ass show, that Tokyo show. It's going to take two episodes of Three Sides of the Coin Radio to play that. So, Three Sides of the Coin Radio, Sunday nights, 8 p.m. Pacific, Monsters of Rock on the Dash Radio Network. Um, Tommy. Anything comment-wise you want to mention real quick? Because we got a boatload of amazing comments after our Dr. Fuck show. Yeah, we really do, and I don't know how to pick them. I can say that a lot of people are really happy with Ralph's uh, appearance on the show, and he was pleasantly surprised. He thought that you guys were going to rip him, and I knew that you wouldn't because you guys aren't those types of fans. And it just was a great episode, so thank you to everybody that's chiming in. I think at this point it's been up for... A day, and we are at uh, 3,400 30, yeah, 3, views. That's just views. YouTube. That's just yeah, YouTube, that's just yeah. YouTube. So yes, so the, res- the response has been amazing. There's just literally too many. It's 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 amazing. I mean, there's a lot of great responses on Ralph's YouTube, on ours, on his Facebook, on ours. Um, more than anything, everybody I think was one completely shocked to see that Ralph came on three sides of the coin. They had, which I don't understand. They, they, they were whatever. totally blindsided by that happening, and two, they just loved the conversation. It was a great conversation. That was a lot of fun. And let me tell you, today, and it's very genuine. And I know Michael shared this with us privately, um, but I, I talked to Ralph today. We were, we were sending some uh, yeah, messages back and forth. You know what I loved? Well, exactly what you just touched on, Mike. He's like, you know, what? I've gained some subscribers. Some of your folks are coming my way. And I'm like, dude, that's what it's all about, man. We, meaning the three of us and Ralph, we're kind of all cut from the same cloth that way. Do we agree on everything? Fuck no. But you know what? We have a lot of fun together. And that's what this shit's all about, man. You know what I mean? And that's when I've said it even on this show. I'm like, do we feel this brethren with all these KISS podcasts and all these other... No, we don't. At least I don't. I don't look at it that way. But Ralph's somebody that I could hang with. You know what I mean? He's somebody that I can right. sit and yeah, talk to. Yeah, we've music. got a lot of music, musical tastes that are similar. And not just major bands like KISS or Sabbath or something like that, but a lot of smaller small bands that never broke anywhere you know i've had conversations with ralph about this stuff and it's just it's it's really cool um you know i think we just we are all from the same mindset we've all love our opinions we we stand behind our opinions and we've got no problem with somebody else having a different opinion that's what it's all about you know 
And that's what I'm proud about you guys, meaning you guys watching the show. And, and that was something Ralph was talking about. He's like, you know, I was so happy with the nice responses on yours. I'm like, well, and I didn't say this to Ralph, but, but Michael, a lot of that has to, to do with you. God bless you with the band hammer. We don't let yeah. assholes. We don't let the assholes. If you're watching the show and, and you're one of the good people, we let you, you not let you, but you comment and it's, and we, we, you know, we're even people who disagree. Matter of fact, we just got a private him. Some person just like, I don't like Mark, but he, he likes it. But you know, you, you agreed with one of my opinions on it. That's the thing. You don't have to like me or like my remark. I don't care. We're just here to talk about music, and that's how it goes. But you can do that and be respectful. And that's what I love about going through 99% of the time. People don't have to agree with us, but I, I like the fact that people are civil. And, of course, when they're not, you, you know, it's out the old hammer. One, one of the interesting things Ralph said to me was, you know, he's – over the years, he's gotten a lot of comments on his shows about three sides. Just out of the blue, people, three sides suck, They blah, blah, blah. He's never understood why they say that out of the blue. Just stop watching us if you hate. But he, in preparation for coming on our show, he binge-watched a bunch of our episodes because he doesn't actively watch our show. And listen, I don't actively watch his show or any podcast. I don't have the time for it. But he, he, he told me, he goes, you know one thing I realized? All those comments about you are wrong. They haven't watched you guys. They haven't listened to they what you said. He goes, it, 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 it's crazy. He goes, you guys just have an opinion. It's a different opinion. Great. So anyway, exactly. that was, you know, the podcast mania. That was awesome. The way that just nobody knew it was coming except for us on the show and Ralph. We didn't tell anybody, kept it secret. And even the week before it, it dropped, Ralph and I were attacking each other on purpose, people, because we were playing you. We were attacking each other on purpose on, on both of our Facebooks, driving people nuts. And, and thankfully, some of you got it. Some of you were smart enough to go, oh, I get it. They're, they're, they're playing us like a, a, a wrestling match here. It's like, yes, we, we don't hate each other. We're not angry with each other. No, I can't, no. wait to have, can't, ha, can't wait to have him back on. Just a fun, fun, passionate music guy, just yep. like us. Yep. Just like us. So mm -hmm. real, real, real quick, we need to mention this. Um, literally today as we're recording this, we just got word that J.R. Smalling is um, suffering cancer. He's battling cancer. And there's a GoFundMe page. You just head over to GoFundMe.com, and you can search you can for it. it. And you can donate to help support him with his cancer treatments because it's pretty expensive cancer treatment that he's going through. Um, so go over. You know, uh, J.R. Smalling's got a, a definite spot in history. Yep, and, and you guys, obviously, you know, we, we've we've had issues when the book came out and everything, but that has nothing to do with this. This is, an, this is another human being who needs our help. And, guys, yeah. we got to be there for him. That's yep. all. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, so, Tommy, something you want to bring up real quick? No, I was just going to say, without further ado, let's roll right into Jacques. Okay. There you go. We need some build-up, though. Tommy, a little bit of build-up. Well, you always announce it before the show starts and everyone knows, so take it away, man. I was going to have Mike take it away. I took it away already. Just watch the show. <laughs> yeah. Ignore these Jesus. guys. God. I can only Bit imagine how much of a clusterfuck this show is when I'm not here. Bit up the blueprints. <laughs> when it Bit gets recorded. God. Yeah. yeah, if it's lucky to even be recorded when I'm gone. All right. My tape out. All right, Jacques, listen to it. Some amazing minutia and and collectibles that he actually shares on screen with us. So yes. sit through this. It's well worth it. Want to get your official three sides of the coin logo and Shocker T? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Hey, 
Hey, Three Sides fans. Um, very, very special day here on Three Sides. Um, a returning guest, a great friend of mine, somebody who in the KISS world for, for collectors, and, and, and especially for the Uber collectors, everybody knows who this guy is. He's the best of the best. The uh, the owner of, of Backstage Auctions, Mr. Jacques Van Gogh. Thanks for coming back. Thank yes, no doubt. Let me tell you, there's some exciting stuff because uh, I've already got my list written down. So <laughs> it's like it's like Christmas for Mark. He's been so it, it ex- he's Christmas. he's been excited for weeks. He's like, I can't wait. You're gonna love it. You're gonna love it. He's got so much cool <laughs> stuff to show. You gotta you're you're gonna love this. <laughs> See, you see the cell I gave him when when you you had to rearrange. I'm like, no, no, we have to have Jacques on. <laughs> if Mark buys anything from the '70s that's packaged, open it before you send it to him. Right, right, right. Hey, uh, all, all, all kidding aside, uh, Jacques, thank you so much for 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 being back. And um, just so everybody knows, big, big, big auction coming up, and obviously the reason Jacques is on. Lots and lots of kiss stuff, and uh, just uh, before we get to Jacques, I just want to let you know the as a collector, I know where some of this stuff came from. It's it's some of the it's from a, an incredible passionate kiss collector. So if you add uh, between the where some of this stuff came from and backstage auctions, you are you are in a can't lose situation. So, guys, uh, Jacques, let's talk about the auction. Uh, and, and thanks for having me back again. I really appreciate that. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know me well enough that, that, that I don't need a soapbox to talk kiss, you know. So uh, it, it is my favorite subject matter. And uh, it, it actually been a while since we've done an auction that had a, a substantial amount of kiss stuff. Oh, but yes. Uh, you know, it, it sometimes just works out that way. You, we, we try to... You know, anywhere from six to twelve months in advance, uh, put together a calendar, and and then life happens. And then you know, there's all of a sudden this consigner that comes out of nowhere, and it needs to be done now, and it bumps another consigner back, or you have a consigner that for some reason needs to delay, uh, you know, their their show, so to speak. So it's 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 always a bit of a moving target here. And uh, but to make a long story short. Uh, we had wanted to do this hard rock heavy metal auction, I would say, almost 12 months ago. And and that's when we pushed it back. And then, uh, I don't know if you, you even saw this or, or, or heard about this, but then we had this great opportunity to do this auction for uh, Noel Monk. Uh, Van yeah, Hale. that was awesome. Yep. Thank you. And and that's what we thought, too. You know, and and, and it's one of those, what I call, you know... You can only do that once, you know. It's like that, that stuff that comes from the manager that was there from day one. Oh, uh, Jack, make sure you tell our audience because not everybody's going to know who know we know. Oh, sorry. So, uh, sorry, but, um, um, uh, my bad. So Noel Monk, very interesting person, uh, goes back to the late sixties days with Bill Graham working in the Fillmore East. Uh, after a couple years, became a road manager. Uh, worked for a host of bands, including the Rolling Stones. Uh, I think his biggest thing was uh, early 1977, uh, going on the road with the Sex Pistols. Uh, they were a Warner Brothers uh, band. Warners was so impressed that uh, he actually managed to not only do the tour, but make sure nobody died, uh, at least not during the tour. Uh, so they said, you know what, we have this, this new group and, and it's a bunch of young kids and they got more energy than, than, than they should have. Uh, we, need a, we need a more mature person to handle these guys. They're, they're called Van Halen. And, um, and Noel was like, all right, never heard of them, never met them before he got the job, never bothered to even basically meet them, was just thrown on the road with them from day one. Uh, when they opened for Journey, uh, they did a couple months with Journey. Uh, then actually, it's so incredible if you think about how things worked back in the day. Then they went to Japan by themselves for their first tour for a week, came back, and then were immediately on the road with Black Sabbath for the, the, the rest of the year. Uh, and the rest is basically history. Of course, when Halen 
you know, a year later was no longer an opening act. And at the very, very peak, and we're talking early 85, uh, David left, uh, David left, subsequently uh, uh, Noel Monk left, uh, and that was essentially the end of that, that chapter. But uh, not before him saying like, okay, I have six years worth of stuff that literally goes back to the very first day of that tour. And, um, you know, I always try to, if, if you want to compare it, and, and for, for the sake of this conversation, I think uh, this will ring home with people. It's kind of doing the, an, a, a bill, a coin auction that starts, you know, in the summer of 73 and goes all the way to like 1981, you know. And, and so, and, and think about the amount of paperwork and letters and documentation and original designs for this, that, and the other. So uh, you, you just you just can't pass up on an opportunity like that, at least not as, as an auctioneer, not as a fan either. But um, so we said, we, we got to do this auction. So when that auction came, I said, all right, let's forget about this hard rock heavy metal auction. We'll do it next year. Um, and then we had scheduled it actually for earlier this year, but then uh, a, a guest who's going to be on your show soon, uh, David Frangioni, uh, came out of nowhere and said, hey, I got all this stuff, but I really need to get rid of it, you know, early in the year. And we were just like, okay, it's not going to be a big auction. So we did that, and now we're finally ready for, for this, this, this rock and metal auction. Um, the upside of, of pushing it back a couple times and, and waiting this long is, is that you just continue to accumulate stuff. And so it ended up becoming uh, quite a, a, a monstrous sized auction. And um, uh, the, the, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but we, we almost have 1,800 auction lots. Uh, I, I've never had an auction that's that big. Uh, wow. Is that, is, is, is that is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, that depends. Uh, I know you love answers like that. Um, if it is eighteen hundred of the same, then it would be a bad thing. Um, in this case, uh, I think it is a good thing for two reasons. One, uh, I, I believe that the, the the quantity is so overwhelming that it will impress people, and because they're impressed, they will talk about it with other people. And I think that. You know, the, the, it, it, it is going to draw more traffic in. The other thing is, is that we were very successful in making sure that despite the fact that there's so much stuff, uh, it is stretched, uh, I would say, almost evenly among, you know, let's say the top 50 hard rock heavy metal bands. So let's say um, I got 50 ACDC lots. I got 50 Bon Jovi lots. I got 50 Black Sabbath lots. So the nice thing is, is that when you go to the auction, and, and even though there's 1,800 lots, if you don't care for Bon Jovi, just skip it. You know, it's yeah. it's going to consume your time. Uh, so we have this beautiful A to Z index, and and there's enough for each artist to make it impressive. Uh, but there's always a couple standouts, and and in this case, Kiss is the standout with with. Um, we're, we're just a few lots shy of 350 kiss lots. Wow. Uh, well, yeah. And Jacques, Jacques, before you go any further, because I know we're going to go into depth with this, but I just had one Noel Monk question. Yeah. When you were looking at the stuff where he brought things in, was there ever any discussion about any pro shot videos, like live shows that he had in his possession? No, they, they, uh, they, they may have, there may have been, um, you know, uh, pro shots made at the time uh, that I don't know. Uh, but uh, in the end, the, the auction did not contain any audio or video. Yeah, because that was the first thing I looked for when I was scavenging through is I was hoping for a pro shot. That's why I was just wondering, since you worked so closely with them, if there was ever any discussion of that. No, there wasn't. So let, let, let me, Jacques, let me ask you, so in this current hard rock heavy metal auction, um, how many different sources did you get material from? I mean, do you have, is it hundreds of different people or is it six different, you know, can you go into that? 
Yeah, sure, absolutely. So in the end, uh, these 1800 lots were, were consigned to us by approximately 40 different consigners. Um, and um, that literally, I mean, I literally have consigners with, with one item, uh, but I also have consigners with two or 300 items. Um, and the, the, one of the challenging things with, you know, when we do these like theme based auctions is I always say, you know, you got to knock on 10 doors, uh, for one or two to answer. And so when you prepare for an auction like that, you know, we, we usually contact a whole bunch of people. We also get contacted by a lot of people and you kind of just got to let it play out because I've been doing this long enough. Uh, to know that that um, a great conversation with a potential consigner is no guarantee for an actual consignment, uh, because life gets in the way. Meaning, you talk to a musician, they want to do it, and all of a sudden they get booked on a tour. Or you talk to somebody in the in the record business, and they got to work on a project, and they can't do it. So. Uh, in, in this case, it was kind of weird because we started off slow and I was like, you know what, this is going to be like a mid-size auction and literally in like the last four or five months, it's like everybody that I talked to said, oh, I'm ready. I'm going to send my stuff now. So um, it, it's one of those things that I try to control, but the reality is, is that I can only control so much of it. And, and ultimately, you just got to go with, you know, with, with, with what becomes available. And and the one thing that I've learned, and again, I'm not saying, saying it's right or wrong, but um, I, I've, I've learned that it's, 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 it's never a good thing to say no. You know, I mean, if you establish a connection with a potential client uh, and you talk about, hey, you know, I'd love to work with you, love to present your, your, your collection in my auction, um, is that when they're ready, I gotta be ready. You know, and I can't say, Hey, thanks, but you know you're 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 just five minutes late. That that's just not in my vocabulary. You know. So so the the, the people who have provided stuff for this auction. First question: Can you name them? And second question: If you can, are they are they names that people would recognize? Are they meaningful people, or are they just private collectors who just have a ton of stuff? Right. Right. No, we, uh, we, we don't, as a rule, uh, we don't uh, take consignments from private collectors. Uh, we've always um, uh, stuck with our model of we only want to work with musicians or people that in some professional capacity are involved with the music industry. Now, that is, I realize that by saying that, that is a very broad definition, meaning that can literally be a, a, a label executive, a manager, a producer, a promoter, but it can also be a guitar tech. It can be somebody who literally did catering at a venue for 20 years. You know, So I'm aware that that is a slightly broad stroke, but I've always wanted to stick to that model because for me, I need to be able to, to objectively verify that where the items came from or where they were supposed to come from and not from a secondary or, or source or what have you. So um, I have a very eclectic mix of, of people. Uh, some of them are musicians, um, and I'm sure I'm going to forget some, but, but um, let's say I got some of the guys from Anthrax um, um, who are repeat offenders. Um, um, uh, I got Pro some of the Probably repeat offenders in buying and selling. Um, I don't know if they bought. Probably, that, well, they definitely sold, but they may have bought, actually. Uh, I think they may have. Uh, but but uh, I do tend to work a lot with Scott Ian and Charlie Benante, who are in this auction. Um, actually, um, kind of out of nowhere, but um, um, uh, there's this new, relatively new band called Butcher Babies. Uh, and, and one of the gals in Butcher Babies, her name is Carla. Uh, Carla actually is in a relationship with Charlie. Charlie had talked to her, um, and that's how, um, you know, she ended up consigning with us. Um, I have some, some musicians from bands like, like Testament and Slayer and what, and, and what have you. Um, 
I do have uh, a number of people that worked for labels, uh, Epic Records, uh, Columbia Records. Um, and there's a concert promoter uh, in this auction. There's there's a, a photographer. Uh, there's actually one or two uh, artwork designers. Um, 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 gosh, I uh, if I have to go down the list. Uh, 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 with respect to Kiss, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, one of the definitely fun designers um, uh, who I believe have been on your show were uh, Tim Sullivan and Adam Rifkin. Yep. Uh, um, you know they they opened their Detroit Rock City vaults and. Um, one of the portions, uh, the KISS portions in the auction is basically their stuff. You know, it's literally all their documents, but it's also props that they saved. And, and you know, I mean, a lot of really interesting things. Um, uh, believe it or not, but it's it's like the the, the bottomless uh, barrel from people like like Lydia, Chris, who, who manages to find stuff. I don't know where it's coming from, but... <laughs> She continues to find a box in the basement, and 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 I tell you, you know, I mean, yeah, you can argue that, you know, sometimes there's things in there. It's like, okay, how big a Kiss fan do you need to be, you know, to buy Christmas ornaments that hang on their tree? Uh, Mark. Although, um, <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, you know, think about who you're speaking to. Oh, he knows. Oh, he knows. Drew. Mark, know. He 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 only needs Mark for <laughs> it, to do a kiss auction. That's it. Yeah. But but you know what? I I have never wanted to be, and I don't think I am. But I've never wanted to be the guy that decides decides for other people what they think is cool. You know, it's like. Um, it's there. You like it or you don't. You know, there's no right or wrong. One of your your mottos on the show. But um, I look at it and say, okay, listen. There, 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 there's, you know, directly, indirectly. There, there's a kiss relation there. There's a story there. Uh, in Lydia's Chris, it's actually kind of cool because literally all of that stuff is in her book. You know, so you can always find a photo where something is hanging in the background. Uh, but the reality is, is that this is probably the seventh or eighth time that I get stuff from Lydia, and it always sells. It doesn't matter what it is. So there's plenty of people that really appreciate that. Uh, but she, do you she, think some of it's written name recognition because it's coming from Lydia? Absolutely. After okay. there, there's no denying. Well, there's two things here, Tommy. I think that the, the, first of all, there's the, 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 about three things: name recognition. That's important. Secondly, uh, peace of mind, meaning it comes from her, so it's not some made-up story, you know, s she signs the certificate, so it comes from... That, that's what I was going to bring up, because when I bought stuff from Jacques that, I, that used to belong to Peter, Lydia signed a card. I mean, there's no fucking arguing. Lydia, Chris, and this came from my house. Right. So, I mean, how much more genuine do you need than that, you know? Well, and, and the third thing is, is and this is important too, is, is that, uh, you know, in the end, um, I always say, um, you know, the, be the best is, is that if you can buy your stuff directly from Paul or from Gene or from Peter or from Ace. And the reality is, is that other than the one auction that, that, that Paul and, and Gene did in 2000, None of these guys have ever sold anything, and there and, and there's a very slim chance that they will. And if they do, they may want to do something again, Paul and Gene on their own. I have no idea of knowing, uh, but I'm just spitballing here. But what I'm saying is, is that uh, um, in the category of, you know, this is as good as it gets. Is is that you know, if you can get it directly from them, then at least get it from the second tier. You know, and that's what I've always been trying to do. I've always been trying to, you know, represent people that worked for a coin management or that worked for Blakeman Marks or that worked for Casablanca Records or that, were, you know, people that were hired by the band as roadies or what have you to, as I said, it's it's trying to get to, you know, that that that's as good as a get level. And, 
And I think with with when you, with with the Lydia stuff, and another another person, by the way, is Loretta. You know, uh, Loretta has, you know, been selling her brother's stuff forever and a day. Everybody knows that she sells on eBay. Everybody knows that, but she always has things that she kept. You know, and and one of the deals that I have with 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 Loretta is is that. I'm happy to put things in my auction. She actually sent me some really nice stuff, but it it had to, it has to be a first. You know, I wanna. It, it's not something that had to that let's say has already been on eBay for a year or in the past or what have you. So, um, uh, but again, you that's that's the length that you have to go to these days to come up with things that are still interesting. You know, again, short of Ace or Peter or Gene or Paul doing their own garage sale. Let, let, let me ask you kind of just a side question. Yeah. Are you pretty much out of people in the KISS world? Like you mentioned, from Casablanca, from a coin management, from Glickman Marks, Roadies. Has that world sort of been tapped out or is there still a few out there that you're you're seeking? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, it is his nephew. So I get a call earlier this week from uh, a guy uh, out on the West Coast uh, who is Neil Bogart's nephew. Um, so, no, not nephew. Ne- I always get confused here. Neil was his, Neil Bogart was his granddad. What does that make him? His, his mother. He, his may, mo- yeah, he, he's Neil's grandson. Grandson. Thank you very much. He's his grandson. Because Neil's dad, sorry, Neil's mom was was Neil's daughter. Yeah, do I say that correctly? So Neil had a daughter, which is his mother. So that makes Neil his granddad. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. So uh, so he he called me and, and and we go through this whole story about um, you know when Neil passed away, uh, Bruce Bird, who uh, is also family. Briefly took over. Bruce died. Bruce had a kid that ended that was a heroin addict. Ended up taking a ton of stuff out of the house. I learned late. I learned yesterday, Mark, that he that it wasn't just Bruce Bird. He also took a ton of Neil Bogart stuff ah. and had been pawning it off, selling it, you know, in record shops in L.A., but also pawn stores and what have you. And so the kid now has taken a, 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 it as a mission. You know, to buy back as much Casablanca slash Bogart slash Bird related memorabilia. And we happen to have a record award that was issued to Bruce Bird that got his attention. That's why he called. And, uh, but it kind of prompted the whole conversation about, uh, and, and this is an answer to, to your question, Mike, uh, Joyce. You know, I have made several attempts at Joyce and I can't get past the gate. Uh, and I respect that, you know, uh, but uh, according to and the conversation that I had yesterday, you know, with the grandson, it, nothing was ever, whatever was safe is still there, you know, and he said one of the coolest things is apparently Neil, Neil kept diaries and he wrote stuff down and he said that one of his greatest, you know, things was, you know, going to grandma's house and going through you know grandpa's diaries he said because I was always so oh. i was always so fascinated by what my granddad did and he said i just wanted to read the stories and he said so i've been i've been reading his diaries and i'm thinking now like oh my <laughs> can you imagine and he told me something that i was perhaps you guys know this but um um, he told me that uh, they are physically already working at the Neil Bogart movie. Oh, good. Yeah, there, uh, and it's it's. I mean, it's 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 uh, financed. It's in production. Now, this uh, is this isn't the movie that Justin Timberlake was involved in, is it? It's a it's a completely different movie. It, the only name that he threw out at me, which was an odd name for me, but I think that later on. I understood why he said, but one that one of the people involved in the movie is Spike Lee, and but then I was like, oh, hold on here. Of course, when it goes when you talk Casablanca, you gotta you gotta look past yeah. kids, obviously. Right. 
you know, and uh, uh, Donna Summer, because they were so big into the disco. Oh, they were, you know, they were the disco label. Yeah, they were for all intents and purposes. They were, you know. So, um, but uh, but anyway, fascinated by all that. Um, but 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 again, you know, getting back to 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 you, Mike, with your question. Um, yes, there there are still people. Um, um, who are on my list and um, the list is getting shorter uh, there's no question about it um, but there are at least five people that I have been chasing uh, for years now um, um, and you have to be careful here you know you don't want to become a stalker uh, and, and, uh, and trust me I'm, I'm, I'm not letting it get to that point uh, I usually call it my annual uh, friendly friendly checkup call. Uh, right. Uh, but but there are there are two people in particular. Uh, one who was there literally from as far back as seventy five, and another one who came in a little bit later in the seventies, who both have substantial collections um, and. Uh, I've I've seen it. Uh, I know it's there, and and it's breathtaking. Uh, but nobody of that group right now is motivated to do anything. So uh, will they? Maybe. Hopefully. Um, um, uh, so so two answers. Yes, there are, and uh, the other answer is. But the reality is, is that. That list obviously is, is short. You know, and, and 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 you and you mentioned that, you know, sometimes it's it's hard to 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 move them along. You know, when I was in 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 working for the merchandising company for with Kiss, one of the things I quickly started picking up on is life events have a way of making people do things. Yes. In the case of touring, uh, we. So the lead singer just got a divorce and he's got to pay a crap load of alimony. Guess what? We're going out on tour. Um, somebody wants to buy a brand new house. Well, we're going to do a reunion because I need to generate some money. So I'm sure a lot of what you deal with is, is similar to that. Right now on any given day of the week, somebody may be like, ah, I've got no interest in it. But a significant life event happens and now they're like, yeah, okay, now I can get rid of all of this stuff and get a nice financial windfall. Yeah, and I watched the uh, ABBA thing on Reels Channel a couple months ago, and it's not like you're that dude that moved to Sweden so he can start boning Agnathia. Uh. So I think you're I think you're good and you're not going to be viewed as a stalker, so it's all good. You just keep making your yearly check-in calls. But Tommy, was he successful? Yes. Really? He was, and he, he was just like this total fucking loser. And I'm like, now he's a stalker, and, and she's like, get away from me. And there's like, he went to court and all this kind of stuff. But it's just like, she must have really been at a weak point in her life. And lonely, living alone, like in the middle of the country. It was bizarre. So if you get a chance to check it out, it's, a, it's an ABBA thing on real channels. Oh, cool. Jacques, before we dig into the the kiss stuff that you're auctioning off here one real quick side question um was there ever any consideration of a vinnie vincent auction considering his reappearance over the last year and he's popped up a few places selling stuff or was that like stay away stay away um and and um i say this with respect uh, uh, first of all um I don't know him in person, so I, there, there, there cannot be and there is no judgment or opinion there. Um, uh, I've always liked him a lot. Um, you know, I, um, um, uh, you know, I can truly say I was there. You know, uh, uh, in the early days, you know, '83, lick it up. Um, uh, met him several times. Interviewed him actually later in life. Um, but you, you kind of have to also go and look at the signs and, and, you know, I have a responsibility, um, not only to consigners, but also to my buyers. And, and I do need to make sure that what I'm doing, 
um, is, you know, I can, I can, uh, I'm responsible for, I, sure. I, you know, to be able, and, and when I see that, um, you know, there, there, there is a, a, a very troubling level of inconsistency uh, in committing and, and all of that, uh, I think the risk is just too high. Uh, that's one thing. And, and the other reason, truthfully, is, is that um, I know that, that Vinny has uh, tried a few times to sell some of the pieces uh, with other auction homes. Um, and um, I, in, in, in good faith, could not let that type of material start at the prices that what was asked for. And I just don't want to do it. You know, I, I see I see value in everything like everyone else. And I try to be reasonable, but uh, there is a sort of discrepancy between what I know and what I've done in the last 20 years. And then when I look at, you know, asking for, you know, let's say $10,000 for a pair of jeans, you know, that have absolutely no relevance to kiss, essentially, you know. Yeah, but that's called integrity. Yeah. You have, you have integrity. That's what it is. I appreciate you saying that, but it's, it's like I, you know, would I would I like to work with Vinny? Of course. I mean, you know, I think he, even though it was brief, but 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 he, he had a legitimate, you know, chapter in kiss history uh and if if things were you know uh predictable manageable liable reliable etc then i probably would jump on it but um i i think what i've just seen the last couple of years scares me you know and and i think i for that reason i probably would not you know go down that road i mean i would work with Bruce in a heartbeat. I would work with with Tommy in a heartbeat. I would work with Eric in a heartbeat. Um, but 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 Vinny. Uh, and again, I, there's no personal relationship here, and there's no judgment here. But just based on what I see, uh, would really or makes me pause. Okay, fair enough. So let let let's dig into the to the uh, kiss aspect of this big auction here let's start talking about some things and maybe showing a few things i noticed something behind you yeah i i, I pulled some stuff out so i can I, I will definitely not bore you i hope uh but uh yeah the the uh, obviously one of the, the the big pieces uh and, and you can see it there a little bit and now I, I think well in the background is the unmasked painting uh, which, which to me is, um, is, is a phenomenal piece. Um, you know, there's only three, uh, album covers that were, were painted, um, uh, Destroyer, Love Gun, and Unmasked. Um, um, the, they, they sold in, in the Butterfields auction, uh, out of the three, this is the only one uh, that uh, a, a short amount of years later um, came back on the market. Uh, it was purchased at that time uh, and has been uh, probably in, in the current owner's possession for the last 15 years. Uh, and that thing is massive. And, and to kind of, I'll, I'll just, just to kind of give you an idea, um, you know, I mean... Uh, this is still me, you know, so you're talking about almost six feet of painting. Um, and I love the fact that it's done in three individual panels. Um, the, the colors are absolutely fantastic. I mean, it is just such a, such a big piece because a lot of album cover art, and I'm not talking just Kiss, but a lot of uh, Kiss, el uh, sorry, a lot of album cover art has, has done almost through the size, meaning kind of like a 12 by 12 canvas, maybe a little bit bigger, you know, 13 by 13, 14 by 14, what have you. Uh, but to see something that is this big, um, I mean, that is, that, is, that is taking up a serious, serious portion of your wall, so to speak. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very excited about this painting. That's beautiful. And yeah. there's only one. <laughs> that can end up in the background of an upcoming three sides episode mark 
in a perfect world. Right. <laughs> well, and, 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 and what's, what's equally nice, too, and, and I don't know if I can do this. Uh, so, so now, do you, do you help, like a guy like Mark, do you help him with uh, refinancing of his mortgage? <laughs> <laughs> and is there a limit? Like, do you have hard money lenders? Uh, well, I would, I would think you would help him sell his house first. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we have, we, let, let's put it this way. I have definitely uh, agreed to installment pay in the past in certain things. Um, so um, that's always an option. Uh, if, you, if you can't fork it over all at once, then uh, as long as you don't, you don't take three years to do it, I think we can talk about it. Okay, good. Well, it's good to know because there might be something that pe somebody wants that it's just one thing, but it's really a big ticket item, and you know that at least it doesn't close the door to them. Right. Oh, absolutely. But you know what's great too is is that uh, uh, so so there's the painting, and actually there's oh I, I want to show you actually another thing first, and I have to apologize. I mean, uh, most of the items are already sealed uh, and we had to do that because we got to put stickers on them so we know what's what uh, i did take some stuff out of the bags but others are still in the bags but I, I hope the reflection isn't too bad anyway um if you look at, at the painting uh the, the the panel in the middle um uh the the the, the part where gene has the you know the the pink scarf around his face well so Victor Staben, um, who was the, the artist that, that did the painting, uh, essentially did everything, you know, based on, you know, looking at images, his own, you know, interpretation of. But then when he wanted to do that, that small insert panel of Gene, you know, covering his face, um, he struggled. And he eventually asked um, to, uh, for Gene to take a Polaroid uh, so he could use the photo, you know, for that. So uh, this piece, um, hold on. Uh, and I, looks I good. Looks good. That there. looks good. Yeah. So, so this is the original Polaroid photo um, that they took of Gene and then gave it to Victor. Uh, and that was the photo that then ultimately led to that second panel in the middle row uh, on the painting. Now that is the kind of stuff I just think is so effing cool. Yep, you know? I agree. Because there's one. There's only one. I know. And I know. and and it, and it's one thing that that so many Kiss fans like. Most Kiss fans probably know of the unmasked painting, but I bet most fans don't know the little story that you just told on how we created that image of Gene. Right. 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 Fascinating. Uh, just fascinating. Okay. It's absolutely fascinating too, and it's um, you know he uh, uh, again. It's just one of those things. It was probably done within five seconds, um, and just say, okay, here you go. Is this good? Yeah, fine, works. And they would never think about it, and you know, and then like forty years later, it shows up, and and you look at it and you go like, you know. Uh, I, I, again, this may be nerd level ten. I don't know, but it's like, but but it is a piece that led to something that became immortal, in my opinion. And 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 I love that. I mean, I'm I'm right there with you guys. I mean, I look at this stuff, and I can get almost more excited about some some stupid ass little Polaroid, you know, than let's say. And, and, and a guitar or or what have you and I, and I don't want to of course of course it's a historic guitar but um it, it's like it's these things you know that screen history to me and uh so this is a very cool piece and and what and uh, what's also uh, nice and i have to back up here a little bit and see how this works but okay so um now i have I have all panels, um, and these are the these are the drawings, uh, pencil drawings on vellum, and uh, and I'll, I'll start with this one. So what Victor did, uh, Victor originally got the invitation from a coin management as 
uh, one of the potential artists to be commissioned with the artwork for the album. And this this first uh, panel is this is this the only one he did at the time. And he presented it to a coin. He had a meeting at a coin's office, and they looked at it and they gave him the job based on this one panel. Uh, it's interesting because the detail on this first panel is actually a little bit more than, for instance, when you go to the second and mm -hmm. all of the others. Uh, but, you know, in his own words, um, he had to impress the bosses, you know, so he put all of his efforts into this very first um, uh, uh, drawing, uh, but this is the one that gave that got him the job. Um, but what's great is, is that, um, you know, so, uh, we have, so we have the original painting, uh, but we also have all the original drawings that were made first before the painting was made. So uh, I'm going to show you another one, um, but to have all these, um, you know, all these, uh, all this pencil art is, is absolutely fantastic. You know, this is probably my favorite one. This is the bottom row. Uh, yeah. You know, this is the, the, the centerpiece of the bottom row. Um, you know, and <clears throat> I mean, one could even argue that each of these, each of these, these, these nine, uh, 11, you know, there's nine panels and then there are like two insert drawings. So there's nine pieces. Um, but obviously, you know, all of them are in and of themselves, uh, you know, uh, pieces of history. Okay, uh, Jacques, I've got a question for you regarding artwork in general, not necessarily these specific pieces. But when you have the original drawing like that, yeah. when an artist takes those and makes copies of them right. to sell in any form, doesn't matter how they do it, how much of a hit does the value of the original take or does the original still hold its value because it's the original piece? Um, you know, I think that's a very good question. I, I think, now in Victor's case, there's only been one piece that he took, which is that, that bottom piece in the middle and that has been produced in a post or what have you. Nothing else has ever been been, been done, but I'm, I'm trying to think, for instance, with Ken Kelly. Uh, yes. And, um, I, I honestly don't. It's a good question. Because um, I, I see I so. see that. Well, I see it from time to time with uh, comic book art. Yeah. And that's what kind of led me to ask you that question, because is, I suppose as long as people know they're buying an original and they're not buying a copy, that's the key to the whole thing. Well, and that's that's how I look at it. Is is that um, even if additional prints are made, and even if these prints are are signed by the artist and what have you, I look at that as okay. That those are that's those are those then basically become collectibles. Uh, but original art is original art is only one. There will own there will always only be one, and nothing will ever change that fact. And uh, you can almost go a step further and say, if the artist later on continues to make reproductions of it, it only helps keep the original piece become, you know, more known, more visible, what have you. So, um, uh, I don't think there's a lot of impact on it one way or another. Jacques, let me, quick question. <laughs> one thing I noticed on the final painting and yeah. on the sketches... The dialogue yeah. boxes have no no words in them. Uh, very. Is, is there any story behind that? Um, though that that was not up to Victor. Victor was not the one that that did the text boxes. Uh, so so, was, so they they basically I'm assuming just gave him directions. We need this person to have a text box. Yeah. We'll figure out what they're saying later. So he couldn't yes. even. It's, that's interesting that he couldn't build around the words that were going to go in there. The what they what they had was they had an understanding and agreement about what the story was supposed to be. 
meaning it was about paparazzi, um, it was about having to live this life with the mask, without the mask. Uh, they wanted to do it in a certain style, in a certain way. So there was a there was a, a an agreement on what it was going to look like, but specifically what each text balloon was going to say that was up to the ad department later on. And so that's why. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. He just stuck to. I'll give you. I'll give you the image, and whatever you want, whatever words you want to write in there, that's ultimately going to be your call. Um, and and no, I don't know. I don't know who did that. Um, I don't know what kind of meetings took place to figure out what the right words were. Um, you know, like in the last text balloon where, where the, the, the photographer, the paparazzi guy says something like they still stink. I don't know who came up with that. I think it, it'll be interesting, but it wasn't Victor. Victor's job was to leave it, to leave it open. Interesting. Great. Yeah. This minutiae there, man. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. So, um, so in terms of, of hey, the, hey, Jack, real quick, can you go grab? Because I, I know what it is, and that's something I'm interested in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, next to the next to the big painting, the yeah. from 1976 from from Canada. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, I, I, I've, I've I've never seen a blank one in person, meaning uncolored. But man, I. That is something that has eluded me for years. I, I, because if you remember the picture, there's a very famous picture of Kiss backstage with a bunch of those. And I actually have the Destroyer Canadian promo poster, which is like insanely rare. But I don't have that. Okay. Okay. So uh, Kiss was in Canada. Uh, local station did this coloring contest. They gave out these posters. Uh, I don't know exactly where the distribution points were, but if I were to guess, probably record stores, uh, either that or radio stations. You picked them up, you colored them, and uh, eventually they would pick the winner. The winner would, would be invited, blah, blah, blah. Typical 1970s PR stunt. Uh, this one, uh, and, and again, I don't know why this one specifically, uh, but uh, Peter liked this one a lot, Peter Chris. Uh, this came from Peter and Lydia. Uh, it was from their collection. Um, uh, later, you know, on, on Paul's costume. Uh, but he just particularly liked this one and wanted to keep it. And, and, so yeah, this is a, a, a 45 year old, you know, uh, uh, kiss coloring contest poster uh, from from Canada. Um, um, but like you, Mark, I've never seen a blank one. I know. I, I I've I've always wanted one of those. I, I it's and again, so there's gonna be somebody out there going, I'm gonna compete and whatever, man. But I, you know, I've boy, I've never even seen that before. I've never even heard that story before. It's all brand new to me. Uh, okay, so it says that it had to be returned to CGBK radio stations. So, uh, or send the record man or miss the sound, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, indeed, it was probably a combination of, of radio and record uh, stores. Um, the first prize, meet the band. Uh, the second prize, a tour jacket and some other stuff. Uh, third prize, tickets to the show. Uh, everybody gets T-shirts and records. Um, and uh, this is from from London Gardens. And uh, if I'm correct, London Gardens was was that Toronto? No, London, Ontario. Oh, London, Ontario. Okay, okay. So again, there's there's a very if 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 you go. On, a matter of fact, there's that site that we're not allowed to talk about. Um, Mike and Tommy know what I'm. It's Fight Club. Um, there's a Fight Club site. <laughs> and and there's there, there, you actually can find it online too. There's 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 pictures of the guys um, in front of a wall of those. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and in interspersed with 
with those, there's also And I just always wanted one of those to go with my poster. And, uh, man, like I said, just file, file. Again, I, I, I've never even had the opportunity to buy one of those before. So, Here's one. And, and so not only is the gray piece, it's a rare piece. It's an official kiss piece. Use their imagination. There's just so much to love about that piece. Just that's just something I really want to own. I really, really like that. I think we were talking about about artwork, and there's actually uh, one more piece that I'd like to show. Um, I mean, there's a lot more uh, that I think is pretty special. Um, and uh, let me see how I can do this without. Uh, Messing it up too much. Uh, okay, so we all know the, the Detroit Rock City movie. Yes. Yep. Uh, this is the original painting um, that was that was made, you know, for the poster, etc. And when you look real quick, you go like, okay, yeah, I know that. But the reality is, is that you don't. Uh, what happened was that um, when uh, when they had agreed on the concept and what the painting had to look like um, again and this is all done in watercolor it's absolutely just phenomenal um, but um, the the original version has roughly 30 faces and images in there that um, and I'll try and bring it in a little closer uh, that you know, they they decided they couldn't use uh, anyone from Evil Knievel to John Travolta and James Belushi and Farrah Fawcett. Um, when they had done it, they looked at it in there like, oh my gosh, this is so great, till somebody at New Line Cinema's legal department says, yeah, but hold on here. If we're going to use this, then we have to get approval from all these people to use the likeness of. And Who is it? Right where your hand was, in the middle of the painting, right there. Who's that guy? Is that a gun? Um, that, and what is that? That's a yeah. gun. I, I do not know who that is. Charlie I'm, Manson? Could be. That could be. Because it's all 70s stuff? Yeah, keep, keep, yeah keep, in, keep in mind, because I remember Tim Sullivan telling me this Talked story. About that on the show. Yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. they basically filled it in with a, a whole bunch of, of pulp pop culture icons from the 70s everything you know if you grew up in the 70s these are people six million dollar man and farrah fawcett and yeah you're evil knievel and anybody like that Ron jeremy yeah you know, so like the wrong jeremy's in there lee majors <laughs> John Travolta, uh, charlie's angels uh but then they they realized that it was going to become so expensive uh, right. to to get essentially the licensing agreements from all these people to use that they said all right we're still going to keep this but we're going to replace all these faces with random faces so uh, the version that all of you or let's say the rest of the world has and knows is the second edition this is the true and only first edition original painting um and and i mean it is absolutely beautiful piece of art uh, so we were super excited to have that in the auction. What's also great is um, uh, once this was done, uh, they had decided to do four uh, lithographs, uh, identical lithographs. I, no, actually, that's not true. They're even bigger. They're about a size bigger than this. Um, and so it, they're, they're lithographs with the original artwork. Um, and when KISS did the private screening in Los Angeles for the Detroit Rock City movie, uh, Paul, Gene, Ace, and Peter were there. And um, they signed these lithographs. And there's only four of them. They're numbered one of four, artist proof. Um, and so we have uh, not only one of those lithographs, but we have number one. Um, so, again pretty prestigious piece if you ask me uh because it's it's one of four 
and it's the artwork that ultimately was not used. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So um, then we have um, uh, we have a, a, a lot of these types of pieces. They um, um, a lot of original uh, advertising artwork, album cover artwork, which all came from uh, Glickman Mark's office. A lot of this stuff was initially auctioned off um, in 2000 in the Butterfields auction, but there was such an avalanche of material, and a lot of it literally was shoved in trunks and, and was never really properly uh, displayed. So a lot of people don't have never even seen this, uh, but over the years, um, it, uh, some of it has come to light. Uh, so, you know, as an example, um, you know, we have um, this, and this was actually, I believe, the layout for the press kit. Um, I would have to look in my own uh, notes, but, um, you know, there's a piece like that there. We have, um, uh, this was always one of my favorites. Uh, this is an old billboard at um, for the KISS singles, the solo album singles. Um, so this is the artwork for, for, for that. Have you seen that before, Mark? I have, I don't, I have the actual ad. I don't, obviously <laughs> don't have the mock-up. I've got to get a bell <laughs> that I can ring every time he says that. Yes, I do have one of those. Ding! Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think what's really cool is, um, let me see here, um, uh, these are quite large, actually, um, but these are the, the, the presentation boards uh, with the layout for the solo albums. Um, you know, so obviously this is Paul Stanley's uh, solo album. Um, I have another one. Um, I actually have them for all four, but Gene and Paul are, are the, the, the nicer ones. Um, again, just... Um, 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 you know, uh, layout presentation boards. Now, do do those do those boards? Any of these boards you're showing are these? Are there comments from any of the band members on them? No, no. There, there, there is definitely a lot of writing on it, but um, uh, without knowing whom, uh, my guess is that's the art department. Uh, <laughs> Jacques, one of the things I was hoping you could show today, and I don't know if it's handy. One of the thing, another thing that I'm, I'm, you know, I've certainly got my eye on, and I sure hope I'm not shooting myself in the foot by this. But I, I, again, for the show, man, for the show, um, that '77 Japanese um, stage design is, is that handy? Where do you see this? And the and the great thing about it is that it's got the date, and this is the thing, because I have blueprints. I, I've owned, I own some blueprints. I've got some show code blueprints. This stuff fascinates the living hell out of me. Okay, so everybody the, bid this up. The good, too, the good thing, too, is, Marcus, is that I know you a little bit, so <laughs> yes. I come prepared. <laughs> but, um, yes, we have... Take it away, Jacques. Uh, we have... Uh, four uh, panel frames or displays with original blueprints. And these actually used to hang at the offices of Glickman Marks. And this one, in, uh, this one that I'm showing uh, contains four uh, stage design blueprints from the 1977 Japanese tour. Um, I have a little hard time, I think, bringing it in. Hold on here. Um, nice. Can you see it a little better now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. See, so there's something for everybody in this auction. Well, Mark, Mark so where would that hang in the house? <laughs> Over your bed? I, I, On well, the ceiling. <laughs> no, there's already a mirror there. <laughs> just, just as a kiss collector... Obviously, Mike, and, and we've all talked, that's, that's one of our eras that we just love. And and it's funny, because, and I don't, because put it this way, because before this is all said and done, Jacques going to sh tell you where to, you know, where to go and all this stuff. There's, because Jacques got some, I, I, that's another great thing about backstage auctions in general, 
I love the fact that you guys put everything out there to see. I mean, you can and you can blow it up and and you could really see in detail what you're you know what you're what you're buying. And one of the cool things about one of those panels is it shows the date. And I want to say it's like February. And you know that tour was in was in April. Well, actually March and ended, and ended April. And I'm like they had they went from that February day design. And they got that thing ready. I mean, I just love knowing stuff like that. And another thing, and this has nothing to do with that drawing, but I have an advertisement where, you know, that tour was originally in in, in, in uh, the spring of 77, was supposed to go to Australia and New Zealand, too, because I haven't, I haven't trade industry ad that said that. So when they were making that, they thought at the time that was going, you know, to those other countries as well. And they ended up just going to Japan. Well, what's great, too, is, is that you're absolutely right about all that. Uh, the, the other ones that we had are all from 1979. Uh, they're from the Dynasty Tour uh, designs. Uh, what's really cool about these is, is that uh, there's basically three people credited uh, with with the layout, and Paul Stanley is one of them. Um, so in addition, to, in addition to two architects, it has his name on it as well. And uh, what I love about these, and again, it's very big, and it's a little challenging for me to, uh, you know, to show. Um, but you look at, you know, what the stage was supposed to be, what it ended up being. Um, uh, I don't have the other panel here, but what's great about the other panel is is that it actually has a massive um, design for um, the portion uh, that was supposed to go underneath the stage, and it shows that the the underneath portion was supposed to have our two separate dressing rooms uh, with. Um, uh, like a like a full safe and and um, essentially they wanted to build everything underneath the stage um, for them to get ready there and then come up. Um, I think that's almost cooler looking than the seventy seven stuff, especially that side shot. Yeah, isn't that cool? With the it the really is. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. Jacques, again, do, do those... What, what do, Jacques was just talking about is exactly the kind of minutia that I love. Did you know originally, like you said, that was supposed to be all in one. You're going to get walk right from the makeup mirror to their pod to go up or whatever. I mean, amazing. You can, you can see in that drawing that little... Actually, it's funny you say that because the drawing underneath the stage shows the, the makeup mirror. And then next to it is like a staircase, a spiral that gets you onto the stage. So they literally would sit there, get ready, and climb up, and they're on stage. You know, and I, I don't know what happened. What well, somebody probably said, you know, what well, sounds great, little impractical because every every venue we go to already has dressing rooms. Why would we have to build dressing rooms under the stage or something? I'm just speculating here, but I like the fact that. Ideas were just thrown around, you know, and Paul Stanley's name is on everything, which I like too, because I can see him sitting at a table at the Coins office boardroom and just spitballing, like, let's do this and let's look at that. And, you know, so, and it's evidence in those, in those blueprints. So, um, we got a lot of that stuff. And again, I'm, I'm just showing you a little bit, but there's definitely a lot of that. Uh, what we also had. Um, um, uh, always um, uh, at the top of, of many collectors' wish list record awards. Uh, yeah. uh, I apologize for showing this one, Mark. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it, we have them literally from the debut album all the, all the way to Unmasked. Um, what I like about our selection this time is, is that almost without exception, uh, the recipients of these, these record awards um, are people that either were part of a coin or part of Casablanca. Jacques, let me stop you right there because this is very important for collectors and, and for people to know. Those are all floaters, correct? 
Yeah, they're all floaters. And, and go ahead, Jacques. Why don't you explain to our audience what a floater is and why that makes a difference? Okay, so um, if you um, um, actually, what's real helpful too um, is the the RIAA uh, has its own website. And for people that want to start collecting record awards, and I'm not quite familiar with, um, you know, what type of record awards there are, uh, and when they were issued, and to whom, etc. The, the RIAA has a really good website. One of the things uh, you can find there is essentially a historic overview of the various designs of record awards and which ones were made in which era. For instance, you go back to the original 60s and the white canvas background, you then go into the 70s and you go to what they call floaters where they made plates that were indeed floating, they're elevated a little bit to a next level where they basically become hologram uh, plaques, etc. So um, um, I would say if you want to just just not only do your homework, that's a good good site to check that out, but it's also important to know that uh, when you see a record award and uh, for a particular KISS album, uh, but it, ha and it could still be an official RIAA, I'm not taking anything away from that, but people need to understand that awards have been, once an award is, let's say, certified, it can be reordered and remade till the end of days. And so you can have an official RIA award uh, for a KISS album, but that was made, let's say, two years ago. And the materials, the, the design, etc., looks vastly different from what the original first generation was. So 1970s, they were all floaters. Um, so this is an indicator of a true 1970s original award. Um, this unfortunately, this one uh, the the backing has been the backing paper has been replaced, um, and the the sticker from the company that made them probably got lost. Uh, but sometimes the sticker on the back will also be a good indicator of by whom it was made, when it was made. Um, but uh, uh, again, the, you have to. Um, it, it, it can be a little complicated, but the, the best advice always is, you know, do a little research, go to the RIA website, and they have very specific descriptions on exactly the, the differences from one to another. Because actually, and I, this is, gets even more complicated, but after the hologram, they started putting numbers, you know, in the holograms itself, and then they became numbered awards, but then they screwed up and then the numbering got all, all convoluted and then they lost track of which award was which number and then they ended up canceling that. I mean, there's all kinds of stories about that. Um, but yes, all the awards that we have, original, first generation, 1970s floaters. Um, That's how you can tell from the 70s ones. Yeah. You know, 70s ones don't, won't have holograms on them. I've, I've had people oh. have actually emailed. I get a lot of stuff like that. People, hey, this guy's got an award. And he sends me a picture. I'm like, that was made last year. That's not right. from the 70s. And this is why we have Jacques on. Yes. Because he knows all of this stuff. Because, listen, get yourself an education for all of you people that are out there that are watching this, that are collecting or listening. Jacques will tell you the truth. He'll help you out. He'll answer your questions. You know, it's it's unlike that guy. Remember the the makeup towel on eBay, where the guy, <laughs> yeah, he said he wiped off Ace's makeup or whatever, and it was like a perfect outline of Ace's face <laughs> on a towel. It's like, oh god, really? Right, right. Well, you know, the, but the other thing too, and 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 this all plays plays part in it. This is that. You know, everything has a value, and 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 you know the, the reason why certain awards are worth a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars as opposed to three hundred dollars, uh, you know, has for instance a lot to do with, you know, are they original first generation or are they uh, made afterwards? You know, and again, it can still be an official RIAA, but. It took, from a value perspective, it makes a huge difference. You know, it's kind of like 
like vinyl, you know, there's a first pressing and there's a second pressing. Uh, and it's no different with record awards. So you, yeah, you got, you got to know um, the difference between one and the other, especially if you want to spend the kind of money on it. And uh, uh, I'm going to say in advance, these are not going to be cheap, uh, but that's because, again, they, they are truly uh, the 1971s, and, and a lot of them are special. You know, I have awards issued... Uh, you know, to to people like from from Casablanca Records. There's people from the Acoin office, Sean Delaney. You know, the infamous. Yeah, I've 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 got Sean Delaney Love Gun. I, I you know I, I well you know I because I got <laughs> from you. I mean, they're the real deal. You know. Well, and and, and but there's 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 a couple that I want to quickly show that are, that are a little uh, near and dear to my heart, and that is that in in the in the late 90s, um, um, and, and I've known Bill Coyne, you know, I knew Bill Coyne very well, and in the late 90s, he was looking to start selling his own awards, and uh, I helped him with that, and there were a number of people that ended up buying them, and some of them ultimately, you know, come back, you know, uh, in, in, you know on the auction block or, 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 you know, become publicly available, and I actually have a number of those, and um, what makes me a little bit sentimental is, is, is not just the fact that, you know, this is like Aces Platinum uh, Solo Award that's issued to, you know, William Guy, a, co a coin, you know, but he signed him on the back, you know, and, and to see, you know, the, where it says rock and roll bill coin, uh, to me, that's, that's pretty rad, you know, that's like, wow, that's, that's, a, that's like a, a, a triple whammy. You know, first generation kids award issued to Bill of Coin, signed by Bill of Coin. Um, uh, I would say the only award in terms of prestige that tops this is the one from Ace. You know, but but short of that, this is about as good as it gets. You know, so um, I, I got. Uh, I'm very very excited about the awards. Um, little geeky, um, but oh, um, I got a couple of these. Uh, the infamous MPAC Awards. Um, uh, again, MPAC, uh, for, for, for those not familiar with it, but MPAC was um, uh, the, the manufacturer of the tape that was used in recording studios for recording albums. And it, and it came on, on, in various sizes, but obviously all the masters were recorded on two-inch reels. Uh, MPAC decided, as a lot of companies did in the 70s, to create their own awards. Um, you know, Billboard had their own awards and, and what have you. Uh, they're not as, as prestigious and as, as official as, for instance, the RIAA, but I always loved the design of it because it essentially it's a two-inch reel, you know, gold-plated. It says MPAC's. Um, we got four of those. This is the, the one for Love Gun issued to Gene Simmons. Um, I got two issued to Bill Coyne. I got one issued to Ace. Um, again, maybe not as prestigious, but for me personally, these are actually harder to find. You don't see these yeah. too often. If there's some pictures of those in Bill's office. Mm -hmm. on, on on the wall and, and also funny story um i remember joe marshall and i were, were we were sitting in our hotel room at one of the new york kiss expos and knock comes on the door it's bill of coin yeah. got a box of those <laughs> it's, it's like well, i'm not i'm not kidding this is how crazy things used to be at the new york kiss expo in the you know, late 80s early 90s uh -huh. bill of coin would walk around with stuff in boxes. I, I One of the things that I'm shooting myself, I didn't buy, because keep in mind, too, back then, I'd bring like a couple thousand dollars to spend. But I remember Bill had the key to the city of Cadillac. I've actually held that, that wooden key. Yeah. That, that There's pictures of Paul Stanley with the bandwidth, but with Paul. And I remember after he left, because he wanted, put it this way, he wanted basically all the money I had. And I, it was one of those things like I wouldn't have any money to get home, <laughs> but, but, but it's like oh, to this day that's that's like one of Peter my, Arquette would have done it, and he would have just slept yeah, in the right. bushes. <laughs> exactly, but anyway, sorry, I just thought you guys would enjoy that story. That was fun. 
Okay, so uh, so then one one other piece that I'd like to show you, uh, record awards related, is um, Kiss only received uh, uh, gold RIA certification for two seven in singles. Uh, obviously, Beth and Lane One, I was made for loving you. Uh, interestingly enough, they're not that easy to find. Uh, album awards are a little bit more, uh, or were a little bit more issued uh, than the seven inch ones, but I I'm excited that we have both. Uh, we got the one for, for Beth, and we got the one for I Was Made For Loving You. Uh, again, you don't see them every day, not that hard to get, uh, easy to get your hands on, so pretty excited with, with this little pair. Um, then moving on to some 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 miscellaneous stuff. Uh, one of the pieces that I know uh, a lot of people get excited about, um, Ace Frehley's guitar strap from the Dynasty tour. Um, there's if I say there's a thousand photos of him with it, uh, it I'm probably wrong. There's probably ten thousand photos of him with this guitar strap. Um, real deal. You know, again, just just a nice piece of of Kiss touring history. That is really cool. Yeah. You want to you want to know? There's a great little Gene Simmons story with that. Do you know the story, Jacques? No. What he, I... said, what, what he said to Ace. No. He said to Ace, he's like, "Hey, did you trademark that design for the guitar strap?" <laughs> Gene was telling the story, and he said, "Ace said no." He goes, "You know, you really should." Because you could sell that, you know, you designed that guitar strap exactly like that. And he said, Ace said to him, ah, don't worry about it, I'll think of something, I'll make up something else cool, basically, like, you know, I'll, ah, no big deal, I'll, I'll think of another great creative thing and be able to sell it. And Gene's like, you gotta be kidding me. And that, that great creative thing he ended up selling was his makeup. <laughs> 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 We have um, we have an in, we don't have a lot of vintage autographed memorabilia, and that's okay with me. I mean, it's um, autographed stuff. Obviously, it, it's yes. It, everybody needs to have at least one complete set of Kiss signatures in their collection. Yeah. Uh, uh, but at the same time, you know, they become so accessible. There's so much out there. Uh, we got a couple pieces, but one piece is kind of cool. Um, you remember Sixteen Magazine? Uh, oh, I, I love this piece. You, know, you, you, you may remember, you know, this cover. Um, it was Sixteen Magazine was great. One of the great magazines that would uh, really make an effort to put original photos in there, original interviews, original messages. And as you may recall, you know, um, Sixteen Magazine was great at asking you know, their, their, their pop artists, rock artists to write a little note, you know, or, or, or sign something for your fans. So, for instance, when they, you know, when they did, you know, the interview with, with, with Peter, you know, Peter, you know, signed it. And then when they, um, uh, bear with me for a second, um, you know, when, when it was Paul's turn, you know, they did the interview with Paul and Paul would sign it. And then, um, you know, they would move on to, you know, to Gene, and, and then Gene would sign it, and so on. So it's not so much that we have that particular 16 magazine, but we do have all the original signature cards that were used by 16 wow. magazine for this that art. Was cool. That was cool. That was awesome. Cool. So we got, you know, this is, this is obviously Gene's. Those are uh, 70s autographs, people. Those are 70s autographs. This is Peter's. Um, I love Aces. Ace is absolutely beautiful. Um, now, see, I, why doesn't he sign it like that anymore? You know, he, I was thought he's that probably was so been cool. signing for so long, and he gets. I, and this is to everybody who does autographs. I think the more years you do it, the worse they get because you just get tired of signing. Yep. Yeah, I believe that too. I believe that too. Yeah, you, you end up with basically two letters. You know, the first letter of your first name and the first letter of the last name, and everything else is just... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, Gene's uh, the worst now, unfortunately. His signature has really gone downhill. Uh, 
it's, it's, and but but there's there's one other thing, and 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 the king collector uh, uh, may 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 catch up on this. Um, so this article ran in the summer of 1980, uh, and as we all know, uh, Peter had, for all intents and purposes, already left the band at the time. Um, I can't say this with certainty, I'm not even stating it with any degree of certainty, other than that I am confident to say that this is probably the one of the last sets of original signatures of all four when they were still together. Um, so, um, um, I've, had, I've had a set of signatures from 1973, um, I have had this signature and it's almost like beginning to end. Uh, but to me, that's kind of a very interesting little add-on. Is is that it's not just the four signatures. It's not the fact that they were used for that article. Um, you know, we have the original magazine that comes with it and everything. But it's the fact that this was probably one of the very last times that they did an article with Kiss with interview uh, with signatures when they were still together. Um, so that's a pretty pretty neat little thing. Uh, that sounds great too. So it's like it's amazing. You got so much to pick from. When does when do all of when does all of this go up online for people to view? And when do the bid, when does the bidding start? Auction the, the preview already started, um, so everybody can go straight online. Um, um, the bidding starts this Saturday. That's when we open it up for bidding. Uh, the auction is going to stay open for nine days. It's a little longer than what we used to, but. Given the volume, uh, we believe we just need a little bit more more ramp up time, so to speak. Um, so the auction comes to a close on Sunday the nineteenth. Oh, okay, there you go. Right. So, so plenty so, of time. So uh, our our listeners will be seeing and hearing this on the thirteenth and fourteenth. So if something interests you, go right away and you can start bidding immediately. And the website is www.backstageauctions.com There you go. Just awesome. and, and, and even if you don't want to bid, go look and drool. Yes. Uh, or uh, go look and drool, but also go look and 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 educate yourself. Um, you know, this th th these are there's there's 350 lots that tell a story. Maybe not all of them, but the majority do. And um, even if you're just a collector and say, hey, I want to understand certain things better, you know, then, then, then use it as a benchmark. Use it for yourself, you know, that say, okay, now that I know that that's there, um, I'm going to do a little bit of more research for myself and, and you, know, uh, you know, get excited about it, you know. And, and, of course, we want all this to go to a home and, and, and hopefully it will. In Detroit. Uh, Yes. <laughs> yes. So what Jacques have... was just talking about what Jacques was just talking about was very important because on an earlier show that we did, matter of fact, it was one of the very first shows that Lisa was on. I I don't remember if it was hers or mine, but we were just talking about some of the documents that we had. Jacques in Jacques' auction is are the documents when Neil Bogart or not Neil, but Bill Coin, excuse me, Bill Coin was getting a little frustrated with Casablanca. And was trying to ship Kiss maybe over to Warner Brothers, or or somebody. I think over it was there. Atlantic was, was. What's that? I think Atlantic Records was where there was interest. It was Atlantic. You're right. Okay. Was uh, anyway. I was just throwing out. It was another label. But Jacques, those actual. And you want to talk about educating yourself? You know, yeah. bid on those things and read that. There's man. They 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 were playing hardball. Kiss. Oh, they were because you know one one of the key figureheads at that record for Austin, and there's basically a letter from 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 Neil Boger to Mo Austin that says, "Piss off, you know, and keep your hands off my guys," and and at the same time, Bill was just saying like. Hey, I'm going to take these guys to the highest bidder because I don't think you're going to give us enough money. And, and so, real quick, this was before a live hit. I know. I know. So, so they could feel something, you know, building. So this wasn't this wasn't after they were this huge success. No, no, no it's, it's it's beautiful stuff. But it's literally documentation with 
you know, conjunctions and everything, you know, and it's, it's this beautiful power struggle about this band Kiss and, you know, and it's Neil being all defensive about it and it's Bill doing what a manager has to do, which is, you know, try and get the best deal possible. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, how can you not love that stuff? You know, it's awesome. Well, I think we need to, we need to, the next week is going to the tagline will be bid up the blueprints. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oh, Tommy. Remember, you, though, if you bid them up, that's a legal binding contract, so. <laughs> I understand. What I do is I buy them and then I'll, I'll uh, you know what I'll do is I'll wrap a Christmas gift in them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and send it to you. <laughs> That's Mark, Mark, Mark won't open the Christmas gift. No, no, it'll stay sealed forever. <laughs> yeah, but it'll, it'll have his it'll have his name and address on it because that'd be it'll the outside shipping. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's fine, but he won't rip that paper to get to the gift. <laughs> so, so what anyways, you, what, Jack, what you got to um, do, actually, Tommy, what you got to do is buy like the Ampac Award, put it in a box, wrap that with the blueprint. So in order to get to the award, he's got to rip the blueprint. Oh, God, well, these guys, I tell you, every week I got to go through this, Jack. Every oh, freaking week. You set it up for yourself. Yeah, you just. I'm just calling Ralph. I'm easily replaced. <laughs> 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 just bring him back. We're good. Jock, right, this was fascinating. Yes, thank you for taking time out of your day like this. And, and, and Jock, I want to throw out another little curveball. Would you, and I'm hoping you'll say yes, not so much you know, in the next few weeks, but maybe in a, a, a few months. Because you're such a wealth of kiss knowledge too. Would you just like to come on as a fan and, and tell some of your stories? I, I think the I think the viewers would love to have that. Yeah. No, I you know, I I'd love to. I can um, as I said uh, um, I love talking kiss. You know, obviously I I grew up on it. Um, well yours is so unique because you grew up, you know, obviously across the pond and then you came so I mean you it just you you saw both sides. Yeah. You know. Oh, and 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 I I think I can I, I can tell about you know what it was to grow up in the seventies as a Kiss fan and you know what we had and and especially what we didn't have and how we how how hard it was but yet how extremely exciting it was to get your hands on anything you know uh, coming over from the U.S. and um, I mean I I can tell you a hundred stories about that alone and. Um, um, uh, but, but, but yes, I mean, if you want to just get a little perspective of, you know, what was, what was, you know, KISS, for, what did KISS mean uh, to, let's say, in the 70s in Europe, um, uh, you know, I think I, I can, I can definitely, uh, you know, share my, my stories and experiences and, and, and some of them are, are I think, are really interesting. Uh, because, you know, obviously, and it makes common sense, it's, you know, most of it took place here, and, and most of it, you know, most of history is documented on American soil, um, um, but uh, th there's definitely a lot to tell about, you know, kids in Europe, and, 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 and even in the 80s, um, you know, the 80s are interesting too. Um, you know, I almost felt that kids started to to favor Europe, uh, almost all oh, the you know, in the eighties. And I think they realized like, wow, you know, and, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, they're everywhere. You know, I, I mean, I, I, it's like, you know, all of a sudden my all time favorite band is here all the time, you know, and, and, you know, they're appearing at a beach party, you know, and, 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 or they're in some record shop in Amsterdam, and it's like, what the hell, you know, how did that happen? You know, kids in a record shop in Amsterdam, seriously, you know, and, and so, so yeah, I mean, all of that happened, you know. So. Especially, I tell you what, from like 1980, especially through the mid-80s, all of a sudden, Kiss wasn't on TV here, but man, were they on European TV. They, 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 you know, they were make again. If you look at it on American soil, it fell apart on on unmasked, where it was just taking off. When on your side of the of the pond, man, it all of a sudden they're in all the newspapers, all the 
all the magazines, all, TV all the time. I mean, and that's through the elder. That's through. I mean, it was crazy. And whereas not nothing over here, you know, just a peep. So yeah, fascinating stuff. I I, I love hearing um, uh, about that because it, it they basically disappeared over here for that time. So fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So um, absolutely willing to do that. Or or I'm also you know. I can tell you also stories about you know auctioning off kiss memorabilia for twenty. Well, that, years. that that's that's the I think adds to your kiss fan stories is you've also had amazing. You've probably had the greatest kiss collection go through your hands. Oh, by far, by so, far. So the stories of what you've seen, discovered, held the personal stories that were conveyed to you by by the owners as they were selling it um that's pretty unique absolutely and it, it's it's um you know um, it's, a, it's a privilege you know um it really is a privilege um um and and, and um um uh, you know I think we all have, you know, we all sometimes go back to, you know, when we were 12 and 14 and 16 and we became KISS fans and, you know, we have all these these grand ideas about, you know, how, how where are we going to end up when we grow up and, uh, you know, we all want to, uh, at some point, you know, we, we dream about meeting the band or something like that and, you know, and then, you know, fast forward, you know, the, the, you guys included, you know, and you, you go and you realize like, hey, you know, somehow, somewhere, I kind of landed in a very interesting little, little spot. And, and I would have never imagined, you know, that that would, would happen. And, you know, so for me, you know, growing up, being a massive KISS fan in the 70s, uh, you know, and getting the latest issue of Roxy magazine and seeing photos, you know, from, from Bob Groom and, and literally having, you know, Bob Groom's jacket, you know, <laughs> that, that I thought when I was at Bob, Bob Groom studio in New York, you know, or, um, you know, um, uh, seeing photos of Gene Simmons with some big burly, bodyguard by the name of John Hart and having John Hart well, itinerary and uh, you know and it goes on and on and it's 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 these these constant you know weird realizations that you know you 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 live through it and you 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 were literally living and breathing that stuff every single day and and you you make all these that that stuff starts living in your head you know and and you're part of it in your head. And then, you know, fast forward decades later, um, you know, you decide based on passion, um, you know, to, to, to start a business, um, you know, that you feel very, very, um, you know, excited about and as I said, passionate about. And then you end up working with these people that you saw in these magazines and you end up working with these people that you read articles about or that you saw on, on little video clips. And uh, so, so yeah, I still love every single bit of that. And, and, um, and I think it helps contribute to, um, you know, doing these auctions and doing them the way I think I want to see him as a fan, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I appreciate Mark what you said earlier about you know uh, when we do when we do a a, a let's say a, a, when we have a listing, um, it's not a single photo with a single paragraph. No, you get ten photos and four paragraphs, and that's because I can't stop myself because it's that part of me that says, but you know, you're not buying just the piece. You're buying the story, you know. There's a story behind this stuff, and and without the story, it's it's just a thing. And I don't want it to be just a thing, you know. I want this to be preserved. I want this to be passed on to the next generation. And I don't want the story to get lost, you know. I don't want the history to fall between the cracks, so to speak, you know. So um, th there's a lot of that 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 that. that 
comes with it and that I really enjoy doing. Awesome. Excellent. Well, I tell you what, because I, I know we got to wrap up here because uh, uh, I know Tommy's got uh, something to, to That was such to a passionate freaking, what did you call it? What's the word I'm looking for? Sermon. 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 <laughs> yes. A kiss, it was a kiss sermon by Jacques. There you go. There you go. Jack, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. Best of luck with your... be talking uh, very soon. Yeah, best of luck <laughs> I'm sure with the will. auction. And, and, and thank you for the opportunity and, and thank you for allowing me to, uh, you know, spread the gospel and 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 and, and help everybody that, that's watching this fantastic podcast to, uh, as I said, yes, of course, I'd love, you know, for everyone to buy something. Uh, but but I equally love for people to just come and check it out. You know, it is it's almost like an online free ticket to a museum. Yeah, well, no, you might find other so. things too by other bands because this isn't just Kiss. That's all we covered here today. But he's got stuff from all these other artists. So get over there and check it out. Backstageauctions dot com. Um, always fascinating. Mark the minutia was over the top. Um, Look, on what other podcast you're going to get, you know, Kiss originally, the D- Dynasty stage thing, they originally were supposed to come out of, right out of makeup onto the stage. The, and, ske- the sketches uh, of the artwork for Unmasked. The Polaroid of Gene. Oh. That was cool. Yeah. And, and let me tell you, one of the reasons I asked him to come back on, and I know we will, is I really wish, because whenever, when Jacques, and I start talking, it's usually an hour long phone call. And he has got such a photographic memory. And like Michael, you pointed out the history that's went through his hands yeah. is just amazing. Yep. Now, I, and I've got a couple funny stories and I won't, I won't give the guys names, but, but I mentioned it lots of times on the show, a really dear friend of mine, we were arguing over um, a towel. There was one with Gene's blood and one without and they were both from the same venue and show. And Kelly, who is who is um, Jacques' wife, wonderful woman, she just kept calling us back and forth because we kept up in the bid. And this went on for like a couple hours. And she's and it just got to the point where I was, you know, insert guy's name. I'm like, okay, what did he say now? And he's like, well, instead of going up fifty bucks, he went up a hundred and said, "Fuck you." And I mean, it's not funny. <laughs> A funny nice way you know and i go yeah well screw him too now it's up you know another 200 and we were going and this went on for a couple hours while we were going back and forth but that's the kind of service you get to you know um i can't say because people ask me all the time about matter of fact i got somebody called me today about wanting a certain poster and everyone's you know ebay and i'm like if you want to get the, the high-end stuff Get a good name for yourself, and and you know people like Jacques. I mean, there's a there's a reason these people go to Jacques because he's the real deal. He's yep. not going to screw them over. So you can buy with confidence from backstage auctions. And I, am I shilling for backstage auction? No, look, Jacques's my friend and everything. No, you're telling the I'm truth. Telling no, because you're, you're going to have to I, spend money for anything you want from Jacques. He's not giving exactly, you anything for free. Exactly. But 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 that especially those to, blueprints. You know, Especially to the younger fans, because people ask me all the time, you know, how did you get stuff or where did you get stuff? And and guys, it's a you have and I don't care if you're in business or being a kiss collector or collect baseball cards. If you have a good reputation for saying if I'm going to spend a hundred dollars on this and you get them the hundred dollars right away, they're going to come back to you again. You know what I mean? That's how come, like I said, you know, all kidding aside. You know these are legal contracts, and when you when you're when you sign up to bid, you better pay them. You know, or they can come after you. So, so, so that you know, you know, that's what I mean. So, if you're serious about being a collector, this is the kind of thing that you want to be part of, because a you can bid with confidence, and like Jacques said, and it's true. Where do you go to his site? You just don't get one little picture and a little sentence. He's detailed. Like you said, he wants the story to live on. And also, let me tell you, when I'm in here, again, you know, something Jacques said earlier, you know, above my shoulder here, I remember the first time I saw pictures of the band and crew in those white 77 tour jackets. Never in my life did I think I'd have one. You know what I mean? And now I got one hanging right behind me. 
that's that piece of me. Does I remember op opening up that magazine and the first time I ever saw that picture. You know what I mean? And there's a great picture of, of Paul and, and Peter you know, with their arms around each other in the, in the white 77 jackets. And, and again, you know, it just brings you closer to your favorite band. And um, again, that's what it's all about. Cause, because collecting, this just isn't stuff. It's, it's, it's history. It's my life. It's passion. And um, that's, that's the fun part about doing all this. All right, so homework. What, if, if you had the money, and f just the few things that Jacques showed tonight. What would you want? Mark? I already know, and I'm not... I, You know, there's part of me I was like, oh, because I told people some of the things that I wanted. And then when we were off the air, I mentioned a couple of <laughs> what I don't want. So, you, you know... Um, I, I I told you I you know there's 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 I'm gonna do some damage in this auction. That's all. <laughs> it's like going to a buffet. <laughs> well, you know what? Again, this is again this is not the kind of stuff you find on eBay because uh, I generally don't do eBay. I don't even for kiss stuff. Uh uh. And I'm very fortunate because people like Jacques and there's and people like Peter Arquette are are you know our uh, other multiple time guest. See, there's people like, like Jacques and Peter that I've met during all my years of KISS collecting, and they know I've, you know, fortunately got, you know, fortunate enough to have a good reputation, and they'll ask me. Matter of fact, um, um, I, I w it was one of the things we just ran out of time. Jacques had something in his, on the new auction, that he needed my advice on, and, um, it, and I, and I, told him because he had the he had the you know there was something he was unsure of uh, it was a, a nice promotional piece and and i talked him through it and then i sent him a picture of mine um and he's like ah that makes sense now because he had the, he had the, the the timeline off well it's a very i tell you what it's a very easy mistake there's a the destroyer mobile yes doesn't have a picture of destroyer it's the hotter than hell cover right and from the bottom hangs the records up into destroyer but it's technically it's a destroyer ad a lot of people think that it's a hotter than hell ad and a lot of people i've seen these at, at kiss expos they only have the back piece and the one picture of the band the picture of the band actually goes on both sides see what jacques matter of fact you can see it in the auction um and he has it corrected now because that's what he he called me, and it was funny because when he when he when he called me yesterday, I said, "I know what you're calling about," <laughs> and he's like, "What do you think?" And I told him, he "Goes, yep, that's what I was calling you about." He goes, "I," he goes, "I can't find enough information on this." And I said, "Tell you what, Jacques, I was because I was going to call him and tell him anyway that he didn't have his his description wasn't correct." Um, so I sent him detailed pictures of mine, and I you know I told him you know and and, and again what he did. It was very common. A lot of people think that that hanging piece is hotter than hell because that's the predominant image on it. But it's technically Destroyer. And again, the, the piece that hangs from the bottom is the is the band discography up to Destroyer. And also another cool thing about that piece, and that's what I was explaining to him, is the pictures on the bottom have a big green tint to them. I don't know why. It was just the way the, the colors, the way they used them. Um there's a very big greenish tint on, on. Now, if you remember, like the first Kiss album and, and Dress to Kill are pretty much just black and white album covers, so they didn't, you know, have much color of them in them. But when you go to the Hotter Than Hell, uh, the Kiss Alive, and the Destroyer, for some reason, the green hue is very predominant. So again, this is the kind of stuff that that you know we sit and we talk about and we go over and. It's just fun, man. It's just fun. So I hope you guys uh, really dug having Jacques. And again, not only is he an incredible businessman and, and smart and honest and hardworking and all those things you want, he's a damn good friend of mine. And um, you have it from me that if you buy anything from Backstage Auctions, you're going to walk away very happy. And I'll tell you another thing, too. No one packs like Jacques. I'm telling you, <laughs> I bought so much stuff off him. That uh, guy Tom, Tommy, how did like that get by you? That guy packs like a... My eyes glazed over 10 minutes ago. Yes. But, but seriously, when you get your stuff, it is so well packed. You don't have to... I mean, you could drop, drop an atomic bomb on whatever you buy. And it ain't going to hurt it. He's very, very good at that. So, All right. 
Backstageauctions.com. Go check it out. Three sides of the coin. I'm not sure we got. Yeah, we have a guest next we week. We guessing. have a guest next week. Um, that's it. We'll see you guys soon. Ooh. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Take Three Sides of the Coin with you anywhere. Download your five-star rated free smartphone app today and listen on your Android or Apple smartphone. Visit android.threesidesofthecoin.com or ios.threesidesofthecoin.com. Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on noise trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.